We all have stories to tell. Each one of us lives in a story. We are characters in a story, the story of life, sharing human experiences, learning from one another, learning from our mistakes, from our joys, from our sorrows. You become a much better human being. In 1988, I'm blown up in Maputo, a bomb in my car, and several months later, I'm recovering at the home of a friend of mine in Lisbon, Portugal. The people there are very excited, and they ask me, Albi, Albi, where do you get your courage from? You seem to be so happy. You've been blown up, you've lost your arm, sight in one eye, South African security agents are after you. Where do you get it from, your resilience? But I suddenly realize resilience, humor, a lack of a spirit of vengeance and anger. Gosh, I got this from my mom, from Ray. Justice Albi Sachs was an avid anti-apartheid freedom fighter who was later appointed by President Nelson Mandela to the South African Constitutional Court, where he helped write the South African Constitution, considered one of the best constitutions in the world. He speaks of the influence of his mother, Ray. If you looked at her, you'd see a nice, smiling, modest, quite attractive woman, and you would never think Ray was a revolutionary. She didn't make bombs. She didn't portray the figure of the heroic soldier with an AK-47. Her weapon was a typewriter. She'd say, tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. Moses Kotani, General Secretary of the Communist Party of South Africa. And Ray's contribution was to be the typist for the General Secretary of the Communist Party. But it meant everything growing up. It wasn't your typical white family with a mom and a dad together, two children in a nice home. It was living for ideals, living with deep values. It was a white woman, my mom, working for a black man, Moses Kotani, not just working for him, but with enormous respect and affection and appreciation of his qualities. And he used to say afterwards with a big smile, Ray taught me to read and write, now I'm her boss. It was growing up with a mother who looked like everybody else's mom, but who was completely, today we would say, alternative in her values, in her lifestyle. It made me so much of who I am. Not through the political slogans and the adherence to a particular viewpoint, but just What's important in life? I grew up believing in the importance of an independent, critical mind, of making your way in the world as yourself as part of a movement for liberation and change. I actually got an official invitation to attend the opening of parliament. There I would be disporting myself amongst the VIPs, to witness the opening of a parliament in which I have been refused participation as a voter. Now I never. Desmond Tutu is a well-respected social rights activist and retired Anglican Archbishop who rose to worldwide fame in the 1980s as an extremely vocal opponent of apartheid. 
His daughter, Tandeka, talks about his mother. I remember her as this very short, stout woman who cooked and cooked and cooked all the time. She was a carer. We used to call my grandmother the comforter of the afflicted because she always stood up for the underdog. If you were in an argument and you were losing, she would be firmly on your side. And even if in that same argument, somehow you got the upper hand, she would quickly change sides. She was a never ending source of love and generosity. Whenever my dad is asked who his role models are, his first one is always his mother. And he likes to say that he looks like her because he's short, with a big nose. But more than looking like her, he hopes that he has her nature and her generosity of spirit, her loving and caring for not just her own family, but for everybody else. Helen Sussman was a South African anti-apartheid activist and politician for many years, being the sole parliamentarian opposing the nationalist apartheid government. She went to parliament when I was about 13 and was there for some 36 years. And for 13 years, she was totally alone in parliament as the opposition to the nationalist government and to the policies of apartheid. We didn't anticipate she'd be away from home for half the year, nor did she. She wrote to me almost every single week. So although she was away from home when I was a teenager, and then I was away from home from the time I was about 19, we kept in very, very close touch. And many of her letters, she's lamenting how beautiful the country is, if only the politics weren't so ugly. She was subjected to misogynist abuse, anti-Semitic abuse. She was accused of being a communist, a traitor, and she always held her own, defended her views, and was absolutely principled. She had huge compassion for people who were locked up, unable to live their lives, and she went to the prisons whenever she could. I mean, her most famous visit was to Nelson Mandela on Robben Island in 1967. And a lot of people have paid tribute to the way in which her visits made all the difference to the conditions in the prisons and really helped them. And one of the prisoners wrote, if she hadn't come, who knows what would have happened. Ahmed Kathy Kathrada was an ANC veteran, stalwart anti-apartheid activist, and one of the nine accused at the Ravonia trial, after which he was imprisoned alongside Walter Sisulu and Nelson Mandela on Robben Island and Paulsmoor prisons. He served for the ANC as a member of South Africa's post-1994 government and later became an outspoken voice against corruption in the government. He talks about the women who mothered him. My mother was in Swaziranika. I only saw her during school holidays. So Mrs. Bard acted like a mother. I was the second person to place under house arrest. They used to have their little children sending food to me because uh, the police won't arrest children. Millions of women play their dual and rightful role in determining the destiny of our country. Master Sulu became like a mother to me. I had to listen to them. For instance, once I was detained in prison for a long time, so I didn't shave. So Walter and I were in jail, and we had visits at the same time. So Master Sulu saw this beard. She ordered me, shave off your beard, and see that you have proper shoes. <laughs> so I had to listen to them. <laughs> Winnie Madigizela Mandela is a South African activist and politician and was married to President Nelson Mandela for 38 years, including during his imprisonment. For some, a controversial leader. 
She's referred to by her supporters as the mother of the nation. Her granddaughter, Swati, tells us of her as a grandmother. In my family, we call her Big Mommy. Whenever I think about my upbringing, my grandmother is so present. She has a unique relationship with each and every single one of my cousins and my siblings. I can sit on the phone with her for an hour, so can my sister, then my younger brother can do the same, and then my cousin can do the same, all in one day, because she makes herself that available to each and every single one of her grandchildren. I was born in Bramford, where my grandmother was under house arrest, in a place that symbolizes a lot of sadness and hardship. In the middle of the night, the police service came. She just took the clothes on her back and they stuffed her in her car and they dumped her in this one bedroom house and she was banished there for eight years. As much as it was a painful part of her history, I think it's also an indication of just her incredible resilience and her courage and her strength and just the ability to continue to fight for what she believes in. Um, to live in a country that just had so much strife in a time that was tumultuous and very unstable. She made sure that our home life was stable and that it consisted of love and laughter and family. There was the stuff that happened around us that was negative, but in my home, it never felt that way. And I think she was very much instrumental in creating that environment that was conducive for us to feel like we were normal and that our childhood was normal, especially because it really wasn't. In many ways, it's wonderful growing up in a family setting, a world where values count for everything. Your beliefs in humanity, in transforming humanity, your sense of injustice, that it's not natural that some people should think they're superior to other people. And the comradeship and the vitality and the energy and the excitement, all of this is wonderful. The price is you are different from other kids. Part of me wanted to be like everybody else, like, like the other kids at school. But for me, there's no doubt the richness of growing up with values and beliefs like that. And they were beliefs that were empowering. And they weren't cruel beliefs. They could possibly come out in cruelty to others. In the essence, they were liberatory, they were emancipatory. I think that's been sort of fantastic. She was the lady who stood at the gate and knew everything that was going on in the street. She knew when somebody needed help. The kids were playing outside and one was being beat up by the other. She'd be the one to shout and rush out of the gate to stop that happening. Siding with not the one in power at the moment, her siding with the one who is in need of a friend, the one who is in need of someone to speak up for them, someone to take their side uh, when things are difficult. We want to show that we recognize goodness when we see it. My dad probably did inherit that it's more than just his theology. It's an inherent part of his nature. You stand up for the most despised, the ones in need of someone to speak up for them, to speak to those in power and speak truth to power. This country is taking her. She was this refuge in a storm. She talks a lot about her grandmother, Gertrude, and she was the first woman who actually showed her that there was an inequality between black people and white people. When she was young, her grandmother owned a shop and the white man arrived in the village and took the shop away from her and the shop closed subsequently. And her grandmother had such rage in her because this happened. Her grandmother then made her aware that this is wrong and that we shouldn't put up with it and we shouldn't accept it and we shouldn't take it. They didn't have the ability to fight it then, but I think she instilled 
in my grandmother the fact that there is this inequality, there is this oppression that's taking place within their community. I think that she took on and she said, you know, I can see that this is wrong. We should stand up to them and we should fight them and we should do whatever it is that we need to do in order to make sure that we don't experience this and that we can end this type of inequality towards black people. I think Parliament took some toll on her health from the sheer exhaustion of being there. She was sometimes having to sit all day and into the evening in Parliament because she had to be there for every debate and she was totally conscientious. And then she was also a political activist. She always went to see for herself. That was her motto, always go and see for yourself. She used to visit Winnie Mandela when she was in Brantford. She visited terrible areas where people were being group areaed out, mm -hmm. um, wretched places. And there are wonderful pictures of her being received by these communities whose cases she would bring up in Parliament. And one of the things she used to say to the parliamentarians is, you sit here making laws for people and you never see how or where they live. You have the faintest idea of the effects of your terrible oppressive laws on the people they apply to. My grandmother is the only politician who still lives in Soweto. She refuses to leave. We've all tried, come live with me here. You know, she's older now. But my grandmother says that if I leave my community, who will look after them? She says, whose door can they knock on in the middle of the night if something happens, if there's a crisis that erupts somewhere within the townships or the informal settlements? She goes, when I'm here, I'm accessible. If I leave the townships, I become inaccessible. So she says, I'm not going to do that to my people. I want to make sure that I'm still accessible to my people so that I will stay. She fought those streets. It's so in her being and in her blood. I think the same with my grandfather. You know, going back home when he was able to, to spend time in the Eastern Cape and be home with the chiefs, and the chiefs can knock on the door and they can come and they can have councils and they can have meetings. My grandfather always seemed the most at peace and the most happiest when we were all at home. He also said, I'm accessible here. People can come and I can resolve a tribal issue if, if needs be. I think for both of my grandparents was important that they, they serve their people till their last days. That's what they do. So they don't know how to do anything else. I think that's what he would like to take away from having been her son, to be able to say, at the end of the day that he stood up for people when it counted. We the people have fought a great victory for justice and for peace. We come from an era.